on the PowerPoint. Click on the PowerPoint. It's not so important when you sit up there, it's quite long enough. Would you like to move it?
here we are. I'm at a slight disadvantage in that the monitor on the, that I can see here has decided not to work this morning. It worked Friday when Gary came and tested it all, but all I can see is no signal. So I hope that we've all got a good signal in our hearts and in our minds. So let, let's pray before I hand over and we start the more formal words of greeting, etc. Father God, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, who is our signal with you. May we be open to hear from you today. Come and speak to hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, Amen. So I need this little issue. So this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. <laughs> so, is there a hymn, a song? I think there is. Oh, it's blinded by your grace. Yes, because we didn't that went wrong last week. So we're going to have it now. Blinded by your grace. I'm going to sit here so I can see it because those monitors aren't working either. Today's reading is from Romans 11, verses 1 to 2a and 29 to 32. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham, from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew, for God's gifts and his calls are irrevocable, just as you who were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience. So they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the Gospel. Hear the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Would you like to be seated? Let's see what's new sleep right what have we got sermon yes this is the sermon <laughs> and it's a sermon about this woman that you've just heard me talking about let's pray father as we think about what this reading means for us today i ask that by your holy spirit you help us to hear what each one of us needs to hear from you today amen so, do you fancy a burger? And if so, where would you go for it? Hands up if you'd go to McDonald's. Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. Hands up those who go to Burger King. Yeah. Right, hands up who'd make their own. No, I don't. We buy them from a certain supermarket. Well, drink to go with it? Pepsi or cola? Cola? cola. Yeah, Pepsi.
Pepsi, tea or coffee, tea for me, strong, tiny amount of milk, as some of you know. So we all have inbuilt preferences, don't we, and biases towards one thing or another. But what about with something a little bit more, or a lot more serious than food, if that's possible? Yes, there are more serious things. Black Lives Matter, or All Lives Matter? Depends on the context. If you're a black person, yeah, yeah, you've got to think about actually the context. Yes, all lives matter, we know that, don't we? But if you are one of the minority that's overlooked and in certain circumstances, then yeah, black lives do matter. It's interesting. Okay, which is the best country? England, of course. I mean, Lee. <laughs> well, we've got someone living in Wales. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's get more local. We're all shaped by the places that we live in, aren't we? We know that. I grew up in Burton on Trent, and from the age of seven. Actually, I moved there from down south. And because of my accent, I picked up the Burton accent within two weeks. The nan said she could never understand a word of what I said after that, but I wanted to fit in. So I adopted that accent. Now, I learnt over the years that I lived in Hornglow, and you learnt that them over in Stateville and Winsall, they were the wrong side of the river. Crazy, and I apologise to anybody who lives in Winsall or Stateville. You're very nice people, but it's just the wrong side of the river. Do you recognise it from Google Earth? Denston, Roaster, Croxton, Hollington, Old might just be in there. What do you think about those places? You've grown up in one of them. What do you think about the people in the others? And what about Utoxeter, Stoke? We've all got inbuilt thoughts that come to mind when we think of the other places. What we think of them and what we think they think of us. Times have changed though, but those biases are still there. What about churchmanship? Robed choirs, bells, smells, incense and the lot, or modern worship band? High church, low church, middle church. Uh, robed choir, north end, that's that end of the altar, you know. Some people would say that's where you're supposed to preside over communion. All these things, Methodist, Baptist, renewed church, free church, Church of England, Catholic, Orthodox, we will have all grown up with ideas about what is proper and right with church. We might not like those ideas, and actually in society we've moved beyond that, and there is great ecumenical goodwill, but there are still those that would say that we're not proper church. I grew up in Horn and Glow. I went to that church as a child for Sunday school, and I, I learned that that was proper church and how you did it. Let's go back to the 90, uh, to 1970s. That's about 40 odd years ago, isn't it? And my choice of where I was going to get married first time round. That was based purely on prejudice and learnt ideas of what was right. I was 19. I didn't believe in God. But I'd always dreamt of a church wedding going to the chapel, we're going to get married, was this one of the songs I sang at school. And just six years before that, at the age of 13, I went to my first disco, and I danced to Spirit in the Sky, and I knew where I was going when I died. What a friend you've got to have in Jesus. St. Thomas's Methodist Church in Horninglow, in the hall at the back, oh, got something in the eye. I knew where I was going to die. I'd got a friend in Jesus. But yet, six years later, that had all gone, that faith had evaporated. But what I had got left was an ingrained sense of shame and fear of the priest because I was living in sin. And those of us of a certain age know what that means. It means you're living with someone you're not married to. And 40 years ago, that was a sense of shame. That was not right. And I was, what could I do? I wanted a church wedding. But I couldn't lie to the priest 
and give my parents' address because you just don't lie to the priest. And I couldn't admit to the priest that I was living in sin. So I thought, well, perhaps I could go to the Methodist church where I lived opposite. We had one room in a house. But to my shame now, I thought, well, that's not a proper church. So registry office, it was. And I didn't think, actually, if I'm honest, I didn't think I deserved a white dress. You know, the whole thing that you have for your wedding. I certainly didn't deserve to wear white. So, but in registry office it was, and that was back in the days when it was in the town hall before it got took around the corner in the building it's in now. The one of the photos actually includes St Paul's Church in the background of it. Little did I know that 10 years later I would be crossing that town hall square in the direction from the town towards Shobham Street, we lived in Shobham Street by that point. And I looked up at that imposing tower of St Paul's and I cried out to God, have mercy. Except I didn't use the word mercy because that wasn't in the vocabulary. It was God help, don't let them take the children off me. Don't let them take the kids off me. Because I was suffering with depression, anxiety, I was falling apart and a friend had told me, you've got to go to the doctor, get it sorted. But I was too scared because I thought they'd take the kids off me because I was incapable, I thought. When a mother is desperate, she won't care about the rights and wrongs. She will call out to God. Whether she believes or in God or not, she will still cry out. And I did. And now you'll be pleased to know, I do believe in God. <laughs> Very much so. I do believe in God. I'm blinded by his grace. I'm glad that song didn't work last week. Because actually it fits this week's reading so much better than last week. How did my mind shift and yes I do believe that Methodist churches are proper churches in fact at one point I was recognized by the Methodist circuit and had responsibility for Methodists um, when I was in Emmanuel Harsford. So today's gospel is about a mother desperate for her child, desperate for healing, calling out to Jesus Lord, son of David, acknowledging what many of the Jews didn't, that Jesus was the Messiah, God's chosen one. And this incident, taken at face value, some people say, makes Jesus look like a racist. She was Canaanite, not Jew. She was a Gentile. And some people say that that woman made Jesus change his mind. But I think something else was going on there. I think, and I know, I believe, that Jesus is 100% human, but without sin. He was born in a culture, would have known and been brought up with people having certain ideas about other people depending on where they live. But he was without sin. Not like us being swayed by family, clan, or grouping that we happen to live in. To go along with what they say, because we all basically want to fit in, don't we? We don't want to be the one that stands out like a sore thumb. We want to melt in with the others. But this woman was a foreigner. She had no right to talk to Jesus. Women and men didn't talk to each other in that culture. But a Jew and a Gentile didn't happen. And it's interesting that he's silent. He stays silent. Is he thinking about what to say? Is he waiting to see how the disciples will react? Have they learned yet that he does mix with the wrong sort? I wonder if he was inwardly a bit disappointed with their reaction, suggesting that he sends her away. I wonder if he thought, no, they still don't get it. They still don't get it. Okay, let's see if she understands better than they do. And so he says something that perhaps, we don't know, but perhaps this is what they were thinking. And he says, okay, I'll say out loud what they're thinking. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Well, this is true up to a point. Jesus came and had a strategy to reach God's people first, the Jews, and then out from there, he would take the, the good news of God's love for everyone out to the world, using his disciples as a team. But he didn't do that with them until after his death and resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit to take the good news to the whole world. But he 
did show that he was the light to the Gentiles, as Matthew writes in his Gospel. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. And also, the disciples were fully aware that Jesus had already healed a Roman centurion's servant and praised him for his faith. Jesus had already restored a demon-possessed man who was also not Jewish. In fact, Jesus spent so much time with Gentiles, making several boat trips across the sea to the other side, that the Pharisees were complaining that he and his disciples were not keeping ritually pure. The religious ceremonies and so on were being neglected, they accused. In fact, the section of Matthew's Gospel immediately before today's is saying that Jesus, Jesus is saying that it isn't the lack of religious ceremonies or eating the wrong foods that makes someone impure, but the thoughts and desires of the heart, what goes on in here, affects what comes out of this, doesn't it? So to believe that Jesus was being totally straight with his answer, I think is a bit much. I think he was doing what we call playing devil's advocate, setting up the argument for someone to argue against. Not that he believed that, but to see what he could draw out from them. And the woman didn't disappoint. She didn't turn away, but persisted and again asked for help. And she, he replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Was he seeing how much she understood? Was he playing mind games with his disciples, showing them their own prejudices were still in place, despite being with him and mixing with these Gentiles? And she shows great courage in challenging him with, Yes, it is, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. I'm just going to sidetrack a moment and think about bread. There were 12 baskets left over at the feeding of the 5,000, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And in fact, if you read Matthew's Gospel, just the next bit after this, he's feeding 4,000 with plenty left over. Jesus claimed to be the bread of life, the one that feeds us. And whoever you are, when you come to faith and trust in Jesus, he's able to feed you to fullness, to overflowing. Not the crumbs, not the leftovers. You don't get the crumbs on the leftovers. But let's not get sidetracked. She was not disappointed. Her faith was rewarded with her daughter being healed. I wonder what the disciples thought. Were their prejudices finally changed? Did their faith have to shift gear a bit, I wonder? This woman and the Roman centurion in an earlier incident were both commended for their faith. They showed great faith. They recognised Jesus. They were not afraid, despite being outsiders, to approach him. They knew he had the power to heal, so they asked. But what of the disciples? Jesus had said the opposite to them. After they'd been scared in the storm, he was asleep in the boat, and the storm came up, and they shouted, don't you care if we drown? And he calmed the storm. And then, as we heard last week, Peter, walking on the water, had to keep his eyes on Jesus, and thank you for that. And that's the one thought I took from that sermon. Keep your eyes on Jesus, and that kept me going. Keep your eyes on Jesus, not the catastrophe all around you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And uh, there's Peter stepping out of the boat. When I saw that illustration, I thought, yeah, we, we've got to get out of the boat. If you want to walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. If you want to get out, if you want to do what Jesus is calling you to do, we've got to step out of our comfort zone, perhaps. Out of our, this is how we do church thoughts, our comfort, our preconceived ideas of how we should be as church and what we should be doing. Keep our eyes on Jesus and he will see us through these uncertain times we're living in now. Perhaps their faith did grow a bit, or at least develop in understanding, but their prejudices, their ideas of religion and how it should be practiced took longer to change. The early church had quite a few lively debates about whether the, Jew, the Gentiles that became believers in Jesus had to keep all the Jewish 
rules and regulations. That was quite a thing. Prejudice takes time to change, especially when important rituals and the way we worship are challenged or changed because they become part of our faith, don't they? It's all mixed in. Or at least the way we express our faith, we become used to the way that we do it. We have that inbuilt bias. Part of the change is recognising that we are prejudiced, we are biased, we do have a preference. Now there's nothing wrong with having a preference, nothing at all. It's when the other is seen as bad, or our way is good and the only way, you know, my way or the highway, some people say, don't they? That can lead to our ideas not quite being in line with where God is steering us as a church now. And faith takes time to grow and to develop. And we experience the different challenges that life throws at us. So, what have we taken from this story of an outsider? For ourselves as individuals, as parts of the church, members of the church, as members of the wider community. What has God got for you today in this? Take a moment to think. What is Jesus saying to you? What are you being challenged with? Or comforted with? You know, my message today might be a comfort to you. Or it might be a challenge. But actually, there's a certain comfort in being challenged. Because that way, you know that you're growing in faith. That you're thinking things through. That Jesus is active. So, if you feel challenged... I'm not going to apologise because actually that's a good sign. And I don't think any of you have fallen asleep. So that's also a good sign. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, take us as we are. Help us to have one takeaway message from today. To see us through the week and the days ahead. Help us to know that you can and do change hearts and minds. So that, so that we are enough, we are good enough in the grace that you give to us day by day. Amen. stand it's working it is now we stand to affirm our faith together in the words of the creed we believe in God the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named we believe in God the Son who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love we believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please sit as we come to a time of intercession.
servant God, let us honour you with our lives. Holy God, may all that encourages people in goodness, honesty and compassion be blessed and grow. May all that encourages self-seeking and cruelty, prejudice and deceit wither and be exposed as the unsatisfying rubbish it is. May we learn from one another's cultures and respect one another's differences. <laughs> Servant God, let us honour you with our lives. Holy God, we thank you for the joy of human love, for all those among whom we live and work. We pray particularly for loved ones who worry us with their health or circumstances or life direction. We pray for those among our friends and families who do not know you or whose faith has been shaken. And we pray today especially for all the local community and businesses, all those who are facing redundancy and all those suffering from the Beirut explosion. Let us honour you with our lives. Holy God, we pray for all whose backgrounds make belief in loving God's laughable or terrifying. We pray for all who suffer, mental or emotional anguish, and those who despair. We pray for those facing another day of pain, another day of hunger, another day of fear. And we pray for today for all those who need our prayers, who are sick. Riley and Barbara Massey, Winnie Pearson, Harrison, Graham Oakes, Pat Oakes, Chris Hall, Ian Pearson. Servant God, let us honour you with our lives. Holy God, gather into your eternal kingdom all who have come to the end of this earthly life and rejoice to see you as you really are. Remember all those who love but can no longer see, and thank you for your overarching love and undergirding faithfulness to us. And we pray today, especially for the family and friends, Maureen, Tanya Ludlow, Jean Jackson, Sue Easter, Paula Smith, and also for the first anniversary of the death of Carol Erst. Servant God, let us honour you with our lives. Holy God, gather into your eternal kingdom all have come to the end of the earthly life and rejoice to see you as you really are. Servant God, let us honour you with our lives. Holy God, remember with gratitude all who gave us so much to bring the good news to our country and pray that with us it may continue to be spread until the whole earth knows you of your truth and love. Merciful Father, accept, accept these, these prayers for the, the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Amen. Is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer each other a wave of peace. Peace be with you. Would you like to sit down as we're not singing the opera tree here? I'll say a prayer offering up our money and our gifts to God before I forget. Not the same, not having the plate passed around, is it? <laughs> Father God, we offer you our gifts, ourselves, our money, to be used to your praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> so there'll be some music. Oh yes, I've forgotten that. Dear Lord and Father of mankind. Sorry. Excellent. Have you got that scented by pure prayer?
your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us peace. Draw near with faith. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your body and soul to everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your heart, by faith, with thanksgiving. Amen.
Let us pray. God of our pilgrimage, you have willed that the gate of mercy should stand open for those who trust in you. Look upon us with your favour, that we who follow the path of your will may never wander from the way of life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We say together, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Will we forget this pleasurable duty? I publish the bands of marriage between Joseph George Brooks and Bryony Lydia Jose, both of the parish of Ley or Lee. This is for the second time of asking. If any of you know any reason in law why these persons may not marry each other, you are to declare it now. Speak. 
pray for them for a moment. Father God, we thank you for Joseph and Bryony and we pray for their preparations for their wedding day and their married life together. We bless them and their families. In Jesus' name, Amen. Someone must make sure that they get read next week as well, please. Thank you. Right, distinct disadvantage. I know we've got things coming up. What's that say? Birthdays, bands, or what else? Feeding the hungry. Yeah, we're feeding the hungry, so keep on with the feeding the hungry. <laughs> Thank you for those who keep the church clean and do your bit. The food bank, um, please drop things off at the vicarage or the spa or the premier. And also school uniforms, because they go to Utoxeter as well. And if you want to give to the church's work, then you can do so by going onto our website and clicking on where you see that picture, there'll be the thing, click here and you can give online. And thank you very much. And um, what's next? Ah, right. Um, before we go on to that, before I forget, so ignore that for a moment. Today is wedding, we didn't do wedding anniversaries. I normally do them before the intercessions, don't I? So we have some wedding anniversaries this week. We have got the 28th wedding anniversary. <laughs> of Wendy and Dan and Tilly. And we also have, that was the 15th of August, that was yesterday, wasn't it? So congratulations on 28 years of bliss. <laughs> and also, I think it's actually today, the 40th wedding anniversary of Neil and Sue Hutchinson, who hopefully will catch this later. Their family are arranging things, so... Um, Congratulations to them. So let's have a, a special prayer of blessing for these two couples. I don't think we've got, where are we, 16th? And we've got the first wedding anniversary of George and Louise Smith, who were married on the 17th here last year. So three sets of people to pray for. Let's pray. Gracious God, on this special day we remember with thanksgiving the vows of love and commitment that George and Louise, Wendy and Alan, and Neil and Sue made to you and to each other in marriage. We pray for your continued blessing. May they learn from both their joys and sorrows and discover new riches in their life together in you. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And speaking of anniversaries, it is also the first anniversary of the baptism of Lexi Grace Edwards, who was baptised on the 18th of last year at Denston, but I'm hoping that they're watching this online at some point today, so let's pray for Lexi. Father God, we thank you for Lexi Grace and pray for your continued blessing in her life as a Christian, as a follower of you. Bless her in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, so that's anniversaries. Have we got any birthdays? Anniversary of birth, anybody? No, no birthdays. Right, okay. So, and one slide that wasn't there was, of course, the Rose King's Ball, Patrick. Have you done it? Is it today? Yeah. Well, let's pray that it stops raining. <laughs> So, Father God, we pray for Patrick's walk today, that you will bless him as he's doing that, and keep him dry, please, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. So, well done. Is the list still at the back to get sponsors? So, if you want to sponsor him, the list is at the back. Please do so. And I think that's it for those sorts of notices. Okay. Yes? Exams, yes. So I didn't quite catch you got a C. Excellent, well done. I know this it's been in the news, people have been downgraded, haven't they? 
That's not fair. <laughs> that is so wrong. But never mind. Yeah. yeah. When you look back in years to come, the grade is less important and everyone's in the same boat, but it's still not fair. Not right. Anybody else got exam results? They're next week, aren't they? Yeah. I'm not going to be here next week. I'm going away on retreat tomorrow uh, to, to Wales, <laughs> to a retreat house in Wales. I'm really looking forward to that um, time alone with God and the Bible um, and some sisters in a kind of home, sort of, not nursing home, <laughs> a convent. <laughs> At least I think they're booked into a convent, not a nursing home. <laughs> Some of you may think, yeah, anyway, stop digging old. Uh, so you've got the Archdeacon next week, Archdeacon Matthew Parker, so do look after him. And that hand sanitizer, the squeegee bit doesn't squish, so I can't screw it. So make sure you've got proper hand sanitizer up there for him and, and make sure everything's ready for him. Excellent. Okay, so I've got some letters that I've had printed. There it is. Everyone on our church electoral roll in family groups and those who worship regularly that um, I'm aware of, including the young people, and I hope I haven't missed anybody off, have got a letter. It's a white envelope at the back, and Jill's going to help distribute them. There's a letter asking you to um, think about um, how we move forward into the new normal as a church. Now, I've got a questionnaire. There is a copy of this in each of the letters. If, as I say, if you're on the electoral roll, you should get one of these. I would much prefer, if you can get someone to help you do it online, please, please, please go online. And that's what it looks like on our church website. RDCH, which stands for Rose to Dents and Crockton Hollington. Snappy title, I know, but that's the, the address of the website. And if you see that, um, if you if you read your worship on the electoral roll, click there if you've had a letter. Now these letters are going out today and this week at some point we're going to try and get them all out. So if you're watching this online, you know, you haven't had your letter yet but you will soon. If you are one of our online congregation and you don't get a letter in the next week before next Sunday, then please go onto the website and that other one where it says, oh, whoops, no that's okay. If you're on if you're on one of our online congregation and complete the survey, click here, because it's a very slightly different survey. Some of the questions are the same and some are different, okay? Next slide, the church members, as in those of you on the electoral roll, it will look like that, uh, but with a heart, okay? So that's the one, if you get a letter, it should look like that. And that has got questions about whether you've been able to access the online worship and things like that. But also, there's four very important questions towards the end. It's, what, are you, what, what did we stop doing? What have we lost during this pandemic that you want to see back? And what have we lost that we don't want to see back? And what have we gained during the pandemic that we want to keep? And what have we gained that we want to get rid of, like masks, but we don't have the choice on that. But, you know, those sorts of things. It's looking to the future of how we do church. So that's that one. The other one, those of you that are our online congregation, it looks like that. Okay. And again, that's how you found what we're doing online. Don't do both. Please do not fill in both. You either do one or the other, not both, please. Um, and um, it includes children. One per household or family grouping in the same address. So, but I want you all to do your own survey. Um, so, even though there's one bit of paper there, so for instance, the till is, I think there's four of you in your house, you've got one bit of paper, but please, four different responses would be brilliant. Okay, do your own. Excellent. So, Liam will help you with yours, won't you? Won't you? Yeah. Yes, is the answer there, Liam. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so please, it, it's your chance to have a say at how we move forward as a church. Okay? I think that's it for notices. Is there anything else, Susan? Is that Karen? What happens to those that aren't on the roll? Can't they just on the paper? Fill the bit of paper.
paper in. That's why you've got the bit of paper. And um, if there's two of you in your house, which there is, one fill it in with red pen and the other with blue or black or, you know, two different coloured pens so that we can see the two different responses on the one bit of paper. I was trying to cut down on costs. Okay. Bring them back to church or post them through my letterbox or if someone can scan an email, do that. Um, and that means that someone will sit there filling the thing online so that we get all the calculations done, won't they? They will. <laughs> Jump in the queue already. <laughs> so I think that's it. Well, what's the birthdays and blessings? What have the youth group been doing? We just had. Uh... And, uh, can we have the microphone so folks can hear? Do you want to go and run down or walk at a dignified manner so that Frank can say what he wants to say? Andre, um, we just had a very, very productive youth group this morning to look at what we're going to be doing from now up until Christmas. Right. So we categorised the groups and uh, put their ideas down of what they would like to dig in. Obviously, we have harvest, we have remembrance on the service. So you're looking forward to the autumn term and doing some great stuff. Excellent. So I think we've covered everything then. So a final, have we got a final piece of music? There is, yeah. Uh, over all the earth. Over all the earth. Lovely. Thank you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the, In the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. If you can take a letter for someone else, then please do. That's it. Come on, running round. <laughs>